the city was being rebuilt. It was a sound and a scene that Dayton was used to. After all, the old courthouse was new once. It was completed in 1850. And it remains a fixed point of reference as the city changes around it. A new college had been completed. The old streetcar tracks restored in Oregon Village. The old post office cleaned and recycled. The Isaac Pollock House relocated, born again, you might say. And it all happened during a single decade. Courthouse Square was a spectacular setting as Christmas ended the decade of the 70s. The giant cranes, for so long a familiar punctuation mark on the landscape, nested elsewhere. Out of the dust and rubble, mist and fog, the new city had emerged. And this is how the city will look during the 1980s. But there's one thing more we might do. To green downtown Dayton could be one of the most interesting and rewarding projects in the city's history. It's one in which every citizen can participate and it will take the work of many people. It's a handsome city from any vantage point, and the Miami River that for years just meandered through town is coming to life again. Boats navigate the waters. Cyclists ride the river corridor bike path, while runners race the clock and each other along what is regarded as one of the most popular mini marathon courses in America. River Edge Park is made ready for many seasons of great performances, while a colorful flower barge is anchored on the city's doorstep. The river projects are right on schedule, so now is the time to green downtown Dayton. The branches will mark the changes on nature's calendar, renewing the city with the coming of spring and then summer, the fluid outlines of the trees providing architectural counterpoint to the rigid and unbending structures of the buildings. And a passerby can pause a moment during a stroll through the plaza to contemplate the eternal joys of nature. Being downtown will be a pleasant experience. Leaves that have fallen to the sidewalk like crunchy pieces of an autumn jigsaw puzzle. If naturalist John Burroughs had encountered such a scene during a morning walk, he might have thought less harshly about cities. As the landscaping is extended to other sections of the city, this will improve the downtown climate providing summer cooling and serving as a winter windbreak. However, the blizzards of 1977 and 1978 put the city to a thermal test that we shudder to remember. Let's just say such scenes look better in retrospect than on the 6 o'clock news. The blizzard uh, will continue most of the day today with blowing and drifting snow. Early views of the city showed an abundance of trees, and the city has always been famous for its green image. Water Street, now Monument Avenue, was mainly residential between Maine and Ludlow in the 1920s. 
Today, this block serves many hundreds more people. Vegetation will help identify uses and areas in the downtown, giving pedestrians a feeling of their own space. We traded in a library for a new addition, and Cooper Park is still a green oasis in this section of the city. Mr. McKinley on his pedestal hardly blinked an eye during the transition. Thanks to anonymous friends, he occasionally participates in some of our seasonal celebrations. Looks like we lost one large tree on the southwest corner of 4th and Ludlow. But the two landmark buildings, the newspapers and the church, are still standing, offering the city timely and eternal guidance. And greenery has appeared along the north side of the street, one of the methods for landscaping where city surfaces have been paved or covered. Bridges are the gateway to the city. Whether it would be feasible to landscape the Washington Street Bridge in such a fashion is something we might want to consider. Ideas and suggestions can come from many different sources, but the Green Downtown Dayton Committee believes the greening should take place within the context of a unified urban design plan rather than by piecemeal plantings. Though postcard artists often look at cities through rose-colored glasses, it is apparent we have lost that colorful mix of architectural styles along Main Street. With business activities concentrated in fewer and larger buildings, the city has been opened with spaces that will challenge the landscape designers. John Gower is a downtown planner, Jerry Eberwine, a city landscape architect. They are making a site analysis of a downtown city block. This is a part of the process that leads to the final implementation of all the planning. John Gower. Another thing we want to take into consideration is the uh, shade factor for the trees planted on the south side of the street and uh, how much sun they're going to be getting during the day, being that sort of a narrow sidewalk on that side. Jerry Eberwine. You do a site analysis. You, you look at uh, certain types of factors, soils. You look at traffic. You look at circulation. Um, all these factors come into consideration. And then once you, have, you understand the, these basic principles that are defining the site, then you come up with design alternatives. And you look at as many possible different concepts that you can think of. Um, some of them may be feasible, some of them may, might be outrageous, but you put them down on paper because there might be something in each one of those that another designer or another person might pick up and be able to generate into a new idea. To complement these ideas, what you do is a series of before and after sketches. Uh, when, you, when a person is able to look at these sketches and, and see what it looks like rather than simply looking down in plan view, um, it gives you a better idea, a better feeling for the site. You can actually see what it's going to look like. When you walk down a space that does not have trees in it, um, it gives you kind of an eerie feeling. You wonder, what happened to the green space? Where is it? And uh, this is one reason why it, there's a real need for trees. We all agree. But did anyone ask the trees and plants how they would feel about growing up in downtown Dayton? Well, they seem to like it. June 1974, a new planting at 2nd and Jefferson. Six years later, a healthy stand of trees. Ask the man who rakes the leaves each autumn. Trees are the lungs of the city, and this vegetation can reduce levels and concentrations of dangerous and annoying air pollutants. Vegetation softens and humanizes the hard image created by the use of concrete, asphalt, and stone in the downtown cityscape. Fountains help absorb, mask, and muffle the irritating noises of the city. Creating the sound that is perhaps the one most favored by our ears, water brings to mind scenes of rural pleasures. And the eye delights in the greens. Emerald islands pressed against the sea of stone. Near the corner of Main and Monument, green vegetation diffuses the sunlight's glare and gives the sidewalk the ephemeral appearance of a garden path. Intersections, usually a bleak joining of diverging streets, can be softened with landscape corners. It is a natural instinct to border our homes with green and growing things, bringing the same influence into the city can provide a common link between neighborhoods and the city center. 
The shopping malls are hardly a forest of trees, and summer heat and winter winds will not find a challenge here. Settings like these, however, can help enhance the quality of life for the downtown worker and resident, attract shoppers, restaurant and hotel patrons, and convention guests. The Downtown Dayton Association is at the forefront in supporting the green downtown Dayton effort, for they believe the aesthetic values of vegetation will result in a more competitive business district, attracting more pedestrians, visitors, and customers. Other cities are greening their downtown areas, like Newcastle, Indiana, but the Dayton effort is unprecedented internationally. Development of a comprehensive vegetation system for a central business district to enhance the urban physical environment as well as its economy, aesthetics, and character. In Muncie, Indiana, only pedestrians use this tree-lined street. Decatur, Illinois, has followed this plan. However, to be avoided is the token tree and the uncared-for flower barrel where the plants thirst and lack attention. Development of this new office building in Anderson, Indiana, reveals a more effective method. Excited by the greening potential of the city's urban design project, the Garden Club of Dayton, the Four Seasons Garden Club, and the Junior League of Dayton hosted a Green Downtown Dayton conference in November of 1979 and officially launched the Green Downtown Dayton project. This project is now involving the best public, private, and voluntary resources to assure that Dayton will continue to be recognized as one of the nation's most innovative communities. The first project to green downtown Dayton is here on 3rd Street where the old Pollock House once stood. The city of Dayton has built a green parking lot for city vehicles. This is a popular technique used in West Germany and Holland, and it will utilize perforated concrete pavers through which grass will grow. It also incorporates trees and planting between the street and the lot. Incidentally, the demonstration project was carried out within the same budget required to pave the lot in a traditional way with asphalt. The Derricks have served us well for more than a decade. Now in the 1980s, it's time for different tools, the hoe, and even our hands. While not all of us will plant the seeds, we can take part in the greening of Dayton. We say green, but we mean the entire spectrum of nature's plants. We're all familiar with the beauty of the flowers of the fields, but for a moment, Look at nature and the city, your city.